I know in Hollywood they say, or, or show business, you shouldn't follow animal acts or kids' backs. I think in sermons shouldn't follow choir pieces like that. That really is the sermon. So thank you all. It was wonderful. I really appreciate it. This has been a roller coaster time in the life of this congregation, I know, and in the Christian community in general. And as I say that, I, I want to say I haven't been to this church uh, as standing in this pulpit in a long time. I think it was about 25 years ago that I was invited to be a guest steward, which meant I was here to tell you how to use your money, how to spend your money or give your money to the church so we could do its work. I haven't had a chance to preach here in that time, but it's great to be back with you all. I appreciate uh, in this time of transition that you're looking to people to, to serve as a, a placeholder for Chance when he arrives in about a month, and uh, I'm grateful that today I'm not asking you to how to, what to do with your money as a steward, but I'm asking you what to do with your heart. That's really what we're about in this when we come together for worship. The, the service, um, as I said, is involved in, or the theme of the day is based on the story from uh, the gospel where uh, they've got the disciples gathered together in the upper room, and I'm not sure if I've got my microphone on now. I'm sorry. Okay, we're good, thanks. Um, where they're gathered in this room after the, the day of Easter. And, and it seems that uh, this is something similar. The tumult they're feeling is something similar maybe to this church's feeling. You had a lightning strike a while ago, and that kind of upended everything that was uh, normal about the administration, about the streaming of the service. Uh, it was Holy Week just a couple weeks ago. We had uh, Palm Sunday, the great festival of that, uh, Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem turned to the darkness of Monday, Thursday, the crucifixion on Friday, and then you had Easter, the resurrection experience that next week. So there was a lot of tumult going on in the, in the community uh, at Grace and also at uh, the wider community. The tumult also of, of losing your pastor who'd been here for 16 months, helping you all uh, sort your way through who would be your next um, uh, settled pastor. And then we You've had a chance to meet, albeit briefly, the pastor who will be coming in about uh, a month and becoming your spiritual guide and mentor or leader in the days to come. This is a time when there are a lot of personal questions you might have, and you've certainly asked, had discussions among yourselves about what it is we're to be now. Who are we now? Where are we going? What's the future look like? So that seems appropriate because that's a question those who were gathered in that rubber room on the Easter night were feeling too. Where do we go now? They'd gathered in this room, they'd found this, this safe room because they were afraid, they were feeling anxious about whether if they were identified as friends of Jesus, then they would somehow be, uh, end up with the same fate, persecuted, perhaps crucified because of their connection with him. And so they, they gathered there in this safe room with a strong door and a, a strong lock, and they sat there and waited for, for something. They didn't know what, they knew everything they'd experienced with Jesus in the last three years had changed, and now it was going to be a different time. Who were they now? It's the same question you all ask yourselves. Who are you now and where are you going? They're lying low because of a fear of, for their own safety, but also for a fear of the, the message Jesus had taught them. Would it continue on beyond his death? They weren't sure that was true. Well, earlier on that day, some of the women in the group had gone to the, to the tomb and had practiced the burial customs of the time. They'd taken spices and oils to anoint the body. And they came back a short while later. Mary, they were almost hysterical with a sense of what had happened there. Mary started talking about, well, there was this open tour in the tomb and there were angels and, and the body was gone and, and I saw Jesus. I saw him. He spoke to me. And they're all saying, hey, this woman has gotten too, too into the, the alcohol too much. She's clearly, does, it's just an idle tale. It really didn't happen this way. It couldn't have happened this way because they knew too much about how death and life worked. Well, that evening something did happen that none of them had expected and changed their image of of Jesus and his death. They thought he was gone for good, but here he was again with them. He showed up in that upper room. The doors were locked, but he showed up with them. It was an apparition, was it, was it a mirage? Was it something they were fantasizing about, wishing would happen? Nobody knew it could actually happen. Jesus showed up in front of them and he said, peace be with you. The last thing they felt was peace. But he said it again to make sure they got the point, peace be with you. He said, as the Father has sent me, so I come to send you. That really was the heart of what he was saying because they had been locked away in that room so fearful of what, what was to come, what would come of them and their, the thing they'd committed their life to for so long. What do I do now? Jesus said, I need to get them up out of this room and going and doing the work that the gospel is calling to do. 
They're inclined to stay put, as any of us would, in those times of anxiety. We tend to cloister ourselves. We tend to shut down when we're challenged by, by circumstances in life. We try to pull, the, pull ourselves together by pulling our, our arms and our legs, and we, we get smaller as people. We do as a church as well during times of transition. Certainly those who were gathered in that upper room were trying to do that, trying to figure out what they do next. Well, they weren't all there, as the story goes. Uh, one was missing. It was Thomas. And Frederick Buechner said that Thomas probably, we don't know what he did, but Thomas, Frederick Buechner said Thomas had gone to escape, get some fresh air, had gone to sit on a park bench somewhere and, and feed the pigeons. Perhaps had just caught a cup of coffee somewhere. And if Thomas was like me, he was always thinking about the next meal, so maybe he'd gone to see the falafel shop was still open. You know, he, was, he was hungry, you know, that's what he did. We don't know what he did. But then he came back in time, and he became what we know as Doubting Thomas. You know the circumstance in the story this morning. Doubting Thomas was the one who was, was the honest one. We ought to call him Realistic Thomas or Dependable Thomas because he was the one who asked that question, surely was at the heart of all the people who were gathered there that day, aren't they? Thomas said, heard the tale that Mary told, heard, heard them talk about how, how Jesus was present with them, and uh, they said, this is, this is an idle tale indeed. This is craziness. Unless I see his, his wounds, unless I touch the wounds in his hands and his side, I won't believe it's possible. He was the patron saint of our realistic, uh, rational selves in the 21st century people. You know, you, you don't have to live in Missouri to believe that the key to life is show me, right? That's what, that's what Thomas believed, you know, show me. And that way we, we identify with Thomas because he was, he was one like us who wanted to know the facts, you know, wanted to know what was happening, why it happened. It was impossible to think of Jesus as being with him again, but he was somehow. He gets the title, title Doubting Thomas because he was full of doubt. He doubted that it was possible for Jesus to return. We often think of doubt as the opposite of faith, don't we? You know, one of the things we try very hard to do in Sunday school is to give kids enough faith. We give them the lessons about the stories and the Bible about life that they won't have to doubt that Jesus loves them. Jesus is present with them. God loves them and will take them now and forever into his care. You know, we, we try to get away from doubts because we sang it last week. I think, didn't we sing joyful, joyful, we adore thee last week? Drive the dark of doubt away. You know, dark, we, we equate doubt with darkness. You know, it's, it's a t fear inducing experience. But doubt is a wonderful catalyst, isn't it, for faith? Barbara Brown Taylor, who's one of my favorite writers, was a, a pastor of a church, Episcopal priest down in Atlanta and Georgia. Barbara Brown Taylor says, doubt often brings me to, the po to poke at what I believe. And when it topples, I realize it was just an idol. And so doubt has been a divine gift that has led me deeper into God. We, we tend to equate doubt with uh, fear and faith with intellectual and uh, certainty. If you have faith, then you know it's true. But it's not like that. Doubt is not a, 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 something that diminishes our faith. It serves as a catalyst for our faith. It's one that gets us out of our locked up rooms and calls us to go into the world to explore where it is we can be Christ's disciples there. Taylor said, faith is more than just trusting God or believing is more than trusting God is more than just believing certain fundamental truths about God, it is trusting God enough to follow God through Jesus out into the world. It's really what she was trying to encourage herself to do when she wrote a book called Leaving Home. It's a wonderful book, came out maybe 20, 15, 20 years ago, where she talked about the experience of being a priest and how the, the work of the church and the beliefs that she was encouraged to hold on to had somehow diminished her faith. She had believed that uh, to be a, a priest, she needed to, to have certainty about things, and she didn't have that any longer. So she used the doubt as a catalyst to, to think about leaving the church. She left the church as an ordained priest and became a professor, a teacher at a university in Georgia. And that book, Leaving Home, that she wrote is a story of her transition from being a priest called ordained pastor to being a teacher. She said, the parts of the Christian story that had drawn me into the church were not the believing parts, but the beholding parts. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, the angel said to the shepherds. Behold, the Lamb of God, John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus, his cousin. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus said to us. Behold, 
is what it's about. It's not about belief. It's not about having certainty, intellectual assent to a set of principles about Jesus. It is rather about falling in love with Jesus and following, trusting him enough to give him our lives. Taylor said, I, I wanted to believe, I wanted out of the belief business and back in the beholding business. I wanted to recover the kind of faith that has nothing to do with being sure of what I believe, everything to do with trusting God to catch me, though I'm sure of nothing. Doubt was a catalyst for Taylor, and it is, I think, for all of us as well. I don't need to talk about doubt because we're, we're in the UCC. We, you know, we, doubt is our you know, common currency. We, we, don't have to, we don't believe that there are certain ways you read the Bible, and that's the only way you can read it, or we believe in God in a certain way. We have a very broad concept of what our truth is. But the idea is that doubt is still a part of us because we, we yearn to be grounded in God. And what we're, what we're trying to do there is to get connected with Jesus. So our doubt is not, is not about an intellectual thing. It's about do we trust God enough? Do we trust Jesus enough to give him our life? To come out of this locked in place, as strong doors at the back, this place that we cloister ourselves on Sunday mornings and go together to serve God. We do that, I think, and when we think about that, we think of, of the, the experience Thomas had with Jesus, where, and the disciples, the other followers of Jesus did as well. They were struggling with their faith and they wanted to somehow be moved off that place. And so they looked um, to him to physically be present with them. They wanted to believe that, that he was still out present with them. And I think when we as, as Christians experience Jesus, it's when we feel the, the, the God, hand of God on us. A good friend of mine, Tom Ott, was a colleague, a friend. He's a pastor out in Michigan. He wrote this last week, a, a reflection on this passage. And I want to share a bit of that word. He says, a pastor, I often felt like I was in the role of a stunt double. When it comes to people's spiritual lives, I was expected to step into their scene and handle their parts. Instead of training for the challenges of living faithfully in the world, they had a stunt double stand in front of them and do it for them. They didn't need to develop the daily practices of prayer, study, reflection, and meditation. They just had to show up on Sunday morning and hear the synopsis of how things played out on their behalf. Tom continues saying, which is why I love the story of Thomas in John's resurrection narrative. He is often cast as the one whose faith was insufficient, poor doubting Thomas couldn't believe. But I see him as the one whose faith was uniquely authentic. Thomas couldn't allow anyone else to play his part. He refused to be a stunt double, use a stunt double when it came to his resurrection faith. No one could stand in for him. Thomas had to experience Easter for himself, as do we. One of the great traditions in the church in Middletown is one that I think probably you all practice as well, and, and uh, Jerry in his words opening reminded me of it. When we gather together uh, to install officers, uh, leaders of the church, we did, used to do it, I think, in, in the end of January each year after our annual meeting. We'd gather all the officers up, the elders, the deacons, like, we'd gather in front, and the congregation would come up and lay hands on them. You've experienced that perhaps when you've witnessed an ordination where you have a pastor kneel down and everybody lays hands on them or on the shoulder of the person connected to them. We did that also when we uh, confirmed our, our young people. Eighth grade, they would come, go through the class for a year or so, and then they'd gather on that Sunday morning. We did it on the Sunday before Easter. Palm Sunday, they would come and, and kneel before us and we'd lay hands on them, pray God's blessing on them. When people were, were joining the church, we'd gather people up to, to gather and... and uh, and lay hands on them as a sign of our connection to them and a sign of God's hand on them, sending from where they were now to into this future that God would be with them in. When people came to the church and, and uh, served as, uh, uh, rather they were teachers on the Sunday, I guess before school began in August, we'd have the blessing of the backpacks. We'd have all the teachers, all the staff, all the kids come up and we'd gather them together and we'd lay hands on them again, asking God to bless them not, not that they can stay there, but they can use the, the power of what they learned on Sunday mornings to go out and do the work wherever they were in their school, and they're learning, and they're teaching, and they're serving. Tom Ott names that, I think, as an experience we have as, a, as individuals, and as Christians, as communities. We are called to experience the, the laying of God's hands on our hearts and our heads and our backs so that we will not stay locked away in this church, but go forth and serve the Lord with gladness. One of the times when that happened best for me was when, uh, as Jerry said, we, we went off on mission trips to 
the Gulf Coast to, after Hurricane Katrina to Honduras, after Hurricane Mitch, and uh, we went to the Jersey Shore. We went to Garrett County. I know our group has worked with your group out in Garrett County to Habitat for Humanity. We'd gather together on Sunday morning before we went, and we'd have people lay hands on us to, to remember that we didn't go alone, that it's easy to stay where we are and to take care of ourselves. So we are called as Christians to leave the room that we're locked away, to leave the place where our fears hold us prisoners, to go out and serve the God, God with gladness. We are called to do that because, in part, Thomas did that as well. It was a week later when uh, the story this morning read from the gospel took place. A week later, the end of the story, Thomas is there. He, he'd heard the stories the week before about uh, Jesus. He didn't believe it, but Jesus showed up again a week later in that room, came through the locked door and, and appeared before them and said the same thing, peace be with you, peace be with you. He turned to Thomas because he knew Thomas had doubts about his presence, about his power to overcome death or anything else. And he said, you know, put your hands out. Touch my side. Touch the wounds on my wrist. You know, you'll, feel, you'll feel the confidence if you do that. We don't know if Thomas did that or not. It doesn't say he immediately did that. We don't know if he did, but he was changed in that moment. He was transformed, as was the group. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. That was the, the response he had to this invitation. And we can do the same thing. My Lord and my God, we are called to make those same responses, not because we have full intellectual understanding about the traditions, the customs, the all of the church, but because we've fallen in love with Jesus and invited, to, or invited ourselves and our friends to follow him and to become one with him. <clears throat> Who knows what happened in that upper room? But we know that they were changed in that moment. They left that room and they soon went out to change the world. We're called to do the very same thing. After we leave this sanctuary this morning, we're called to go out into the world and serve it with gladness and joy and confidence that God has gone before us and will continue to go before us. <clears throat> Last night, I, with all of you, read the uh, or watched the news about the terrible uh, bombings that took place in, in uh, Iran, from Iran and Israel, and the, the tumult that was taking place, is taking place, I should say, in the rest of the world. And it happens in the context with all the other devastation that's happening in, in Gaza, in our cities, and in our lives, in our homes, perhaps. It's a time of great fear. <clears throat> How do we go out in that world with confidence that we can make a difference? I think we listen to the words that were, may have been spoken by the first disciples who were there that St. Francis gave utterance to when he wrote it a prayer saying, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. <clears throat> where there's doubt, faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there's darkness, light. Where there's sadness, joy. Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. May it be so for you and for me. Amen.